Hi, this is Shubham Tiwari. And this is Paras Kohar. And welcome to the Sales Panel Podcast, where we highlight the journeys and the playbooks of thought leaders from the B2B world. Tune in for all the things on data-driven marketing, product-led growth, and customer intelligence. Our guest today is an experienced marketing operations and analytics leader who has helped large brands and startups implement successful marketing operations, foundations, from text text to data collection to process to analytics and reporting. Yes, I'm talking about Rekha Morgan, who is an integral integral part of marketing ops. Rekha, welcome to Sales Panel. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited to be here. We are so grateful to have you. Uh, one of the most interesting things about you is that you call the various aspects of your profession your hobbies. So can you tell our audience about the marketing ops and the role you play in it? Yeah, I think... I think marketing ops, as it continues to grow um, um, in in the world that we live in, right? I think it's it's relatively juvenile discipline still, where there are very few folks that actually have a breadth and depth of experience across the whole of it, um, right? Where marketing operations in some organizations can 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 entail a lot, like lead operations, campaign operations, um, right? Like the whole process behind it, as well as like setting up the whole data pipeline behind it to make sure that it all flows from team to team as things get set up, um, as well as setting up all of the technical backend of the tech stack, right? And making sure that there is actual data flow so that you can automate and streamline process across all of your demand generation and down as well as how marketing helps with outbound sales or even just triaging inbound sales. So there's a lot that it encompasses and I've played across all of it. Um, right. And the one thing I didn't mention that kind of drives both like your strategy behind like what you set up first, as well as like how you optimize it is really the underpinning analytics of everything you do. Um, and marketing ops plays an integral role in that because most oftentimes marketing ops is, is responsible for setting up, right, all of your data collection strategy, whether it's on your website or through data enrichment providers, and then it's responsible for figuring out what to do with it, and then how you leverage that downstream in reporting and analytics to figure out how you loop it back in to identify what you need to change in your marketing strategy. Right. So what was your reaction when you heard that Google is shutting down universal analytics? And it has been, you know, in countries like France and Italy uh, for violating GDPR. So how do you see analytics shaping up from this point? Yeah, I think I think analytics is moving more towards a first party um, first party methodology, right? As opposed to what we've been traditionally used to. So when when I thought that Google was shutting down universal analytics and moving more towards like what they're rolling out with GA4. Um, and yet event driven analytics, I, I wasn't surprised just because over the last like few years, um, most of the great marketers that I've worked with and what I've tried to build out as well is, is more event driven website analytics as opposed to kind of like what we're used to with like page views and different things that tell us very little about how the user is interacting with our brand. And so like, for instance, what we built at Sprinkler was really, we we barely use universal analytics. Like we used it a little bit, but we use segment as kind of like our event track layer on top of amplitude. Um, so that we did basically what is happening in GA4. We just did it with different tools. Right. So like you said, you know, um, with the introduction of predictive analytics in GA4, uh, emphasis on data, modeling third-party cookies going away and uh, data governance related standard operational procedures are also becoming clearer. So uh, we, we also believe that the importance of first-party data management is more important than ever. So uh, uh, let's get into some details. What do you think, what pinpoints uh, first-party data address for the sales and marketing processes for a data-driven business and what role um, does marketing ops uh, have in it? Yeah, so I think first party data is going to become more and more important, especially as we see the degradation of like third party data, right? Like Apple has already shut down third party tracking by default. Mozilla and Firefox have done something similar. And we're going to see that with the rollout um, across Chrome, right? And Google devices over this next year. And so I think with that, like 
that that's the biggest pain point that first party data solves, right? For for most people. And, and I think what that really means is people aren't going to have to invent their own tracking solutions. What it means is that there's going to be companies like Segment or other analytics tools that allow you to 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 basically proxy what they're doing, right? Like proxy their code so that it shows up on a first party domain um, on your website so that you can control the tracking that way, or they'll allow you to kind of like pick up their code, host it yourself, right? Um, and build it for you. I think we're gonna end up seeing a lot more of that from providers like, like Segment. So the businesses don't have to invent everything that they're doing, right? Someone will build the baseline and allow you to leverage it. Um, in a first party methodology so that you can still collect all of that data. The benefit there is that there's so much data once you actually identify a user through a PII event, right? Like a form fill that you can link all of that data back to. Um, so you can think of things like HubSpot, right? That have been doing that yeah. for a lot of years where they track like your analytic data for usage on the website as well as when you submit a form, as well as everything else, right? But right. With, even, with platforms like Segment, where you can integrate even more tools, right? And then you can dump all of that data into um, a warehouse or a data lake like Snowflake. And then you can pipe in all of your Salesforce data and you can pipe in all of your data from everywhere else and create a unified CDP, right? Where you can then start leverage all of your first party data. But I think what that really means as well is that there's going to have to be either way more technical marketers that yeah. you know are kind of like bridging on being data scientists or <laughs> you're going to have to have very technical marketers that are very capable of working with CIO team or your data team or whoever owns the warehouse right so that they can create like the data models that you're going to need to to make that data effective and impactful for your business right right i think things are getting exciting uh, if you talk about the first uh, party data, you know, there was not much support. If, uh, if you look at the Facebook uh, server side conversion API events and things like that. So because the third party data is, was working really nice and okay. So nobody was paying attention. If we even uh, use uh, the first party data for, let's say, better uh, audience creation or retargeting. But now this is the only option, or at least it's going to be the only option. Uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and other ad providers are also supporting that, and uh, that has uh, made it uh, very important. So I think things are going to be, um, from, if you look at the data pipelines, you know, things are going to be, like you said, we need data scientists, and it's going to be very sophisticated setup, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think what that might mean as well is overall, people are worried about less data, but I think in the end, what it becomes is more, more concise and thoughtful implementation of data collection at a first party level so that right. we have less data but we have better data right which right. is going to yeah. help the whole data pipeline become way more impact for a business so long as they can get the right users to to you know to to service it and and show insight and then close leave that back into business strategy exactly nice yeah right so raika you help bridge interdepartmental gaps and help remove siloed strategies. We at Sales Panel are also, you know, removing misalignment between sales and marketing in a way. So from a marketing ops perspective, can you tell us what are the major reasons for this misalignment? I mean, I think a lot of the ones that I've seen are typically due to goal misalignment, as well as potentially having separate leaders that drive your sales organization versus your marketing organization. And so with that, if there's not good collaboration at the top, then that's going to filter down through your departments, right? And so marketing is then going to have its own set of goals and sales is going to have its own set of goals, right? And sales might be improperly incentivized to go after their outbound initiatives, right? As opposed to handling what Mark is trying to help them with. And so typically where I see the most alignment is really on like account-based selling or account-based marketing models, right? Where you have um, a small group of marketers that are working directly with your sales reps to make that work, right? But then you still might have a gap on like the inbound side, right? Where reps are, you know, the, the age old argument of like, you know, marketing is like, well, we're sending you all these MQLs, right? And sales is like, well, they're all trash, right? And so um, it's, you know, figuring out how to collaborate there, I think is is really like the biggest thing. And so I think having a common goal, right? Where like marketing, um, is responsible for a certain percentage of pipeline, but that that percentage of pipeline is 
is a portion of like sales overall percentage of pipe, you know, that they're supposed to do for the business in a, in a given time period and that they're not incentivized to go after outbound over inbound, right? Because the idea here is that, well, and here's the other disconnect is that there, there are too many marketing teams out there that are also trying to take credit, right? And the reality is, it's like even sales can only, like sales does a lot. Right. And, and honestly, like they, they can take most of the credit, but in some business models, sales eventually has to hand off to, you know, like a legal team or they have to hand off to um, strategy teams that come up with pricing models for specific businesses. And there's so many things that happen to get a deal over the line. Right. Or to get pipeline generated that like it's a team effort. And so if you can get your leaders all together on board with like, we're all in this together, we shouldn't be fighting. Right. Marketing is not trying to take credit for a steel pipeline from sales and sales shouldn't be, you know, they shouldn't feel like marketing is encroaching on what they're trying to accomplish either. So then instead of like fighting against each other for credit, they were all pushing in the station together. And that's when, that's when we accomplish our goals, but that's, you know, there's, there's a lot that has to happen there. Like at, at Springler, for instance, like my team partnered very closely between demand generation and the inside sales organization there. We brought everybody together in a meeting regularly, at least weekly, and we talked about the entire funnel. We talked about the marketing channels. We talked about what was producing, what wasn't, what demographics, what technographic data we could apply to it to see like how things were working. And we got feedback from both sides on what we should do with it, right? Like maybe this buck bucks, right? Doesn't progress. We're going to shut it off and send it straight to nurture, right? As opposed to qualifying it and sending it over. Um, and so as long as we had everybody in the room making those decisions together, the relationship was, was really good um, because everybody knew what was happening, who was making the decisions and why, as opposed to just decisions being made in a silo. So I feel like marketing ops really helps if they're, if they're doing their function correctly, they're bringing these departments together, right, to, to establish consensus between them. Right, right. So I think marketing ops, you know, sort of can be, you know, really sophisticated. So if you if you just talk about essentials, like you have covered a lot of ground in the last question. So if you have to talk about essentials, uh, and coming from a point of view where not every business has, you know, resources to, or at least they are not allocating budgets for, you know, a really nice marketing ops set up from the very beginning. So what are the essentials that you recommend um, maybe for like, you know, connecting the website, tracking data with CRMs. So what are the essentials of tracking that you propose can, you know, um, help uh, businesses accelerate the pipeline, you know, by just 20% efforts and 80% outcome? Like what kind of essentials you would recommend uh, someone can start with? Yeah, I think, I think at a minimum, what you should be trying to do is, is at least track your channels um, on a first or last touch basis, right? If that's all you have access to, um, right by by UTM collection or you know like there's there's a lot of ways to collect that data and get it into your form fills right as they're coming so and so I think at a minimum doing that because what that does is it, you, if you can collect that and string it together across your entire funnel that's going to help your demand generation team at least have an idea of like what's working what's not like are the unit economics good for this channel or are they bad and do we need to like shift to something else or try a new strategy or optimize the channel um and then as well as tracking the type of form bill that was given right and how those get qualified so setting up rules right like if you've got a basic salesforce implementation that you know you don't have like a lead routing tool um, like lead ring or, you know, like, um, like lean data, or you don't have like HubSpot sales or something where you can do all of your sophisticated routing, where maybe you're just working with like Salesforce, um, routing rules, then you can still leverage each of those data points that you're collecting in a form fill to decide like what gets qualified, who it gets sent to, what, you know, what parameters need to exist. And so, you know, tracking your form types, whether it's content, whether it's hand raiser, you know, whether it's actually sales ready or not, so that you can figure out what to do with it. So that you're, and, and making sure that all of that information and how you're doing it is available to both your demand gen and your, your sales team or whoever those leads are going to. So that everybody, like there's no surprises in what's getting routed and what's not getting routed. So that marketing is not in there thinking like, hey, like we generated 500 MQLs and you only got 200, like what's going on, right? Like, um, 
And so I would say like at a bare minimum, right? Like tracking UTMs, what page things converted on your website, as well as like what the content type was or whether it was a sales form. And then making sure all of that data ends up in your CRM so that you can at least stitch that data together at a minimum, because that will bring information to both your demand generation team as well as your, your sales team so that they can see like where something was sourced from, they can be aware of what it is and so that they know how to pick it up as well. Awesome. Um, this next question is about your process. Um, uh, this is from fellow marketing ops professionals uh, who are looking at your experience. So you have built marketing ops tech sticks for several large enterprises. As we can see, Rakuten has thousand plus employees and Sprinkler has 4,000 plus, if I'm not wrong. Of course, we saw your meme where the, there's this cat and she has a worried face because the sales department is buying a new tool without the evaluation. So can you talk about your process when you're starting from zero in such a setup? You know, how do you start? How do you make sure things are in place? Uh, we can go technically. What do you look at? How do you initiate? What tools you choose in the beginning? How do you look at the scale of the operation and how does it all stitch together? Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> whenever I walk into a new organization, like my goal is, is to talk to as many people as, as influence the pipeline, right? Or really just your, your kind of like your inbound and outbound funnels as possible to understand like what's where and how it's funding. Um, just because marketing ops tends to own, you know, like the collection of the lead, the processing of the lead, whether it's, you know, through like, you know, data enrichment or whether it's through, you know, the lead routing and then moving it forward from there. And and then there's all of the data outputs that happen in your CRM or your marketing automation platform. Um, and then there's all sorts of email that's going on for stuff that's already in your system, right? So really, really trying to set like a baseline for like what activities are happening across the systems and processes that marketing ops owns. And then going through and figuring out what technologies are handling what, right? And oftentimes when you, especially if you walk into a small startup, small startups, especially in the SaaS industry are built on the backs of engineers, right? And if you're bootstrapped or you don't have funding, engineers that are buying an expensive solution tend to create a solution, um, which is not a bad thing. I think there is <laughs> definitely a time and a place for that. But as businesses begin to scale, that becomes problematic. And I've encountered that a number of times, right? Where it's like, all right, Let's figure out where our tech debt is and figure out how we need to create a solution for it, right? And whether this is a software implementation that we need to do, right? Or whether we need to fix, you know, let's keep our home baked version of it, but let's like create a more scalable version, right? And, and partnering with IT on that. But typically it's doing, you know, kind of like a full floor audit of like, what's going on? Is there tech debt that we need to unwind? Um, and what does our strategy and planning need to be moving forward? And from there, really, it's also making sure that like we set a baseline with all of these teams that I'm connecting with so that we have an open door of communication where that like when they want to implement a new tool or they want to onboard a new service that they reach out to my team um, as well. And not, not so that my team can be a roadblock, but so that we can be a strategic partner on finding either the best solution, right, or making sure that the solution they want will do what they expect it to. Um, Right. And I think that's that's oftentimes, you know, like what that meme refers to is that there's a team that gets pitched, they have budget and they're like, we're buying this thing. Um, and then they buy it and they're like, here you go, guys, like integrate it. And oftentimes, like, you know, companies will tell you that Salesforce integration or a map integration or something. And, and what that really means is they've got an API you can hook up to Zapier, um, <laughs> which is not an integration. And so the idea, right, is to steer clear of, of as much of that as possible, work together so that we can implement technologies that we feel good about implementing effectively into the rest of the stack so that we can use the data strategically as a business and that we can get it to flow and function how, you know, the team that wants to bring on the technology is expecting it to function. So I, you know, like marketing ops, like depending on what they want the tool to do, I think marketing ops tends to be more of kind of like the technical resource on helping them vet the technology and making sure that it creates and plays well with the rest of the stack. Um, as well as that we feel, you know, for me at least when we're, I'm onboarding new technology, what I want to do is pick the vendor that I feel like is innovating the most as well, where I see that like their product roadmap, 
aligns with like what we're trying to accomplish in the future. So mm. maybe they haven't built it yet and maybe we're not ready for it yet, but it's where we want to get to choosing partners that you feel like you can scale with as opposed to having to implement a partner that will work for now, right? And then you might have to drop it and unwind it and pick up a new partner on, which just is a headache for everybody. And that's not something you can always avoid, but it's typically what I try to do. Right, right, amazing. Yeah. One of the things you're highly passionate about is Mart MarTech. What recent advan advancements do you see that you know make you excited? Yeah, I think <clears throat> there's a lot going on right now. I think um, some of the things that I'm most excited about are really what are happening with customer data platforms. Um, there's, there's a lot of arguments to be had about how to set it up. I think this is kind of like the shiny object thing right now where there's a treasure trove there that people know that if they do it right, they'll have access to it, but it's figuring out the right way to build it, right? Um, so you have vendors like Segment, right, that are the CDP or can be the CDP, um, or you create methodology of, you know, a warehouse first CDP where you can still use tools like Segment or others, but the idea is that you're leveraging them with the end goal of piping your data into the warehouse, right? And then layering a reverse ETL tool on top of that to then pipe the data back out to your tools um, to make it actionable. So I think there's a lot of interesting things going on in that space right now. Um, that are gonna give marketers the ability to do a lot more than they've been able to do before. Um, I see a lot of progress being made for customer marketing, right? Especially with these PLG motions that we're seeing across the industry right now, um, where <clears throat> we can see, you know, we, we onboard people into these free trials, we're doing event tracking so that we can figure out, you know, like now we can do a product, um, a product qualified lead, right? As opposed to an MQL. And if we can identify a product qualified lead, you know, based on their actual interactions with the platform, um, that is much more highly, you know, like qualified to send over to sales for them to, to try to like close a deal on, as opposed to an MQL that, you know, just submitted a general information request on your website, as well as like with customer marketing, if you get the right tracking implemented across something like, you know, like segment in your product, um, or even just amplify your product with the products that these teams are, these companies are producing, then it enables a lot for your customer marketing teams now as well, where they can leverage actual product usage data to do their marketing and create new segments that they haven't been able to before. So instead of just, you know, having all of your transactional emails that you're just sending to your customers, um, as well as like your monthly newsletter sending to your customers, we're actually creating um, an event you know, an analytics and event driven approach to customer marketing to either help with like upsell based on how we see them using their product, right? Like we can leverage all of that data to create predict models, you know, or white space models that show like people that buy this first tend to buy this next, right? And so if we see them buy it and we see them use it a certain way, right? We can leverage all of that data to kick off automated email streams or audiences or cohorts that we can then deploy customer marketing to um, to try to upsell them, right? And so it gives marketing now an opportunity to participate in an upsell, I think, where it ha in a much more pragmatic way where it hasn't been able to in the past, right? Where upsell has typically just been driven and supported by your customer success and sales teams that own that account. So I think there's a lot in that space. Um, I'm really like, obviously, like I'm very interested in like the data collection side of this and seeing <laughs> if we like can't it. get it all in the same place. Um, so that we can figure out how to leverage it, right? And that's that's where I like to be as well. It's like after we get all of the pipelines together and it gets you know dumped into the warehouse, I, I really enjoy getting in there and, and starting to write you know the SQL behind it and trying to figure out like how do we unify all of this to start reporting on it as well as like how can we figure out how we can leverage this data that we have now that's rich, that's first party, that's against our own product, that's you know it's getting right. really cool. Yeah, sounds like the data part and the data-driven marketing is actually getting its uh, deserved meaning. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, let's move to the next question. So, you found your way to marketing ops and data analytics from social media marketing, um, right? So, this question is from the perspective of aspiring marketing ops professionals who are trying to develop 
their careers uh, that is uh, somewhat under the umbrella term of marketing ops so what what would be your top advice to these people these professionals who are looking forward to this yeah i think i think right now it's it's leverage every free resource you can and get involved in communities right because there's there's a lack of structured training for marketing operations professionals so like for me i got hired you know early in my career to really social media growth um and you know like 10 years ago when when social media hacking was like a big thing right um <laughs> And, you know, like where, where companies actually thought that was like an effective way to, to grow followers, right, is, is to figure out how to best like game the system, right? And all yeah, of these yeah. platforms have now created, you know, things that, that try to inhibit that um, so that it's less effective than ever. But that's what I got hired to do. So I was always more interested in kind of like the technical aspects of how to make that happen as opposed to like being an organic social person. Um, and so for me, like, really what that spun into was just kind of like following my interests there, but also like keeping a broader scope of like what was impacting the entire team. Cause like I got hired to do that, but I was also on a team of like two people or three people at the time. And what I noticed is that like marketing could never hire more people. We could never get more budget because we could improve how we're impacting the business in any way. Right. And so mm. like from there, like I, I already had, <clears throat> excuse me, I already had a natural affinity for analytics. And so that's kind of like where I swerved into was like, that's all nice. right, let's figure out how marketing reporting works. And really it was like, we had one Salesforce admin and he had like an access database that was like local on his machine. Like he owned the whole system and it was all bad. Um, and so it was like, how do we get away from this? How do we develop, you know, like a more modern marketing analytics system and, and getting the right data into the CRM to actually prove things right. And like one thing led to the next where, you know, I now owned analytics and building that for the marketing team. And now I started to own like data collection and attribution, right? So that we could figure out like what was coming through the website and this and that. So I owned the website, right? Because I had to figure out how to get all of our tagging implemented and make sure we we're collecting things the right way. And I think honestly, like I was kind of, right place, right time, because I was given the freedom to kind of follow what I thought was interesting to an extent, but I also worked for an ad tech business with Interaction. And so I had a lot of mentors across ad tech to help me with, you know, like, how do we track things? How do we, you know, like, what's our methodology here? Um, and, and so I think I had that benefit, right? And so it kind of became like a slow taker over, takeover of like all the things that marketing operations owns as I, as I worked through that. Um, a lot of people now that marketing ops is a formal like title within business don't necessarily have that. They don't have that formal training. Maybe they've worked in email marketing before and they've built things, you know, within Marketo or HubSpot or Pardot where they've created, you know, basic flows for nurture or drip or something. And now they're like, now you own marketing ops. <laughs> and a lot of people don't know what to do with that. They don't know what data to collect or how to collect it. And so like, like marketingops.com, for instance, is an insanely good community where people can join for free. There's a huge Slack channel associated with it where people can go in for like whatever automation system they use, whatever CRM they use, and they can drop questions. And the community responds almost instantly um, and gives a variety of feedback, right, to help that user get done what they need to. Um, apart from that, like HubSpot is insanely is insanely good about the training they offer because it's basically all free, um, right? Like you can spin up a free HubSpot instance and you can go through like and get all sorts of certifications and in-depth training at no cost and without being part of an organization that even uses the technology, right? And I think that would, that is like a free resource that gives people super in-depth like, like understanding of, you know, systems obviously skewed towards HubSpot, but that knowledge becomes applicable across the board um, for other systems, right? Because most of the systems yeah. that we use, they're all the same in their underpinnings. They just have a different UI on the front end um, that you've got to get used to and figure out how to use. And so if people will go through, like, you know, get over the fact that they don't use something like HubSpot and go through and do the training, like they're going to benefit immensely from it across their career. Um, so, you know, like for aspiring professionals, get involved in the community. Like there's a ton of them now, um, right? You'll, you're seeing them pop up all over Slack. 
they're messing with algorithms like Zoom Info has, right? Where people are, you know, putting that they're part of communities at RevOps or something where it's concurrent with their existing job. And now Zoom Info thinks that they've changed jobs and <laughs> they're alerting your sales system, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. And so there's they're they're popping up all over the place now. And I think there's a huge opportunity for people to get in and, and be able to leverage the collective network of of you know professionals that exist, you know, across the, you know either just beginning their careers in the middle of their careers or that are more advanced that have been doing it for a long time. Um, and then obviously like there's, there's more paid resources that exist yeah. out there right now. I think LAX um, has, uh, which used to be the MarTech Alliance has a full like cohort of training that um, they've, they've worked with like Daryl Alfonso who runs marketing offset at Amazon web services to create which obviously like comes at a cost, but it's also like in-depth, it's a super in-depth, like eight week course, um, give you a good splash down into like what marketing ops is and how to do it, how to implement it across a business. And so I think there, there are more and more resources there, but like when in doubt, reach out to somebody in the community, like go and build out your LinkedIn presence, go and connect with professionals that you aspire to be like and reach out because you know, like, at least for me, like, most people are more than happy to share what they know, right? Like, sometimes we're a little bit busy. Um, but for me, like, this was kind of like a journey, like self progression, mm. where like, I didn't have a mentor growing through this, like, specifically right. in marketing ops, because they haven't existed. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. so I want to make sure that like, I can be that for people as well. So shameless plug, I guess, to whoever listens to this is that feel free to reach out to me. Um, with any questions, right? And sure. I'm happy to point you in a direction or give you whatever answers I have. But I want to make sure that like, I, I obviously I like marketing ops and the role that it plays within a business as well as across everything in growth operations. Um, and I want to help that, you know, continue to progress and, and mature as a discipline within businesses because I don't see it going away. And I want to be able to help young professionals make sure that they're, that they're able to progress their careers in the way that they want to. Sure, sure. We really appreciate your uh, spirit about this and we'll be leaving uh, links to your community when we, whenever we post this on LinkedIn and, and on our blog so that people can find you. Yeah. Now, uh, over to Shubham. So yeah, since we're in the third act of our interview, a couple of rituals to go through. First one, as a yeah. you know, marketing ops professional who's deeply passionate, you know, who has a love for data and analytics. What are you reading nowadays? Uh, please suggest some books to our audience or some aspiring marketing ops professionals. So I, <laughs> for me at, at this point in my career, um, my reading is, is probably more geared towards um, leadership than anything else, because that's a role that I've been playing, um, you know, as of the last like four years of my career. And so, I mean, books that I read early on in my career were like books from O'Reilly on like how to learn <laughs> SQL and how to learn Python um, to help me do what I needed to do at the time, right? And so, I mean, there, there's lots of free stuff out there. So Dan McGaw, he started McGaw.io, which is like a big kind of like marketing ops agency. He has a book um, that he's put together around like basic strategy for marketing ops people that want to build a cool tech stack um that's that's called like building cool shit um i think and i think he offers that book for free you might have to pay for shipping but it's on mcgaw.io um and so th there's things like that that i think give people a good baseline um but otherwise a lot of of what i'm reading is is probably more across um i read a lot of forums <laughs> when i need to solve yeah. problems right and so you know across different communities whether it's you know across like what I need for a marketing automation system or a sales engagement platform. And I read a lot of documentation, um, which is not exciting. That's not going to excite anybody that I'm saying like, go read documentation. <laughs> um, those are, you know, that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now um, in terms of like what I'm reading and what I'm studying. Wonderful. Yeah. We'll, we'll mention all these books and sources in the description. Cool. So lastly, uh, would you like to nominate anyone for our show so that we can continue to have these wonderful conversations? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of good people across the industry that have a lot of, of good like thoughts, I think, about a lot of this stuff. And a couple that I've, I've worked with recently is 
um, a guy named um, Ian Shields, who who has, has done a lot of kind of like similar work to what I've done across my career, but he's also been involved agency side and kind of consulting side and probably has a little bit of a different spin than I do since most of my work has been in-house. Um, another one is a guy named Brandon Carter, who runs all of like marketing automation implementation from an agency model. And so he's got a breadth and depth of experience across like more platforms in marketing automation than almost anybody at this point, I think, um, because of what he's seen and what he does there. I think they both would have some super interesting insights about how the industry has been moving and shaping over the years, because they've also both been doing it for a really long time. Right. Riker Morgan, thank you so much. This was really insightful and inspirational in a way as well, because, you know, the love that you have for analytics and data shows. So I hope our audience will, you know, also uh, get infected with that, with that love that you have. Thank you. Thank you once again. Cool. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation, guys. And thanks to our audience as well for sticking with us. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you so much.